Good morning. I'm Judy Trezotis, President and Publisher of the Times-Picayune, The Advocate, and The Acadiana Advocate. And welcome to our 2023 Economic Outlook Series. Everywhere you go, it seems people are talking about the economy and how it's impacting their daily lives. Today's panel will cover those topics that are front of mind for all of us as we look forward to the new year. Thank you for watching. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Renee Sanchez. I am the editor of the Times-Picayune. Uh, and welcome to our discussion uh, this morning of the state's economic outlook. Uh, I'll be joined today by uh, our business reporter, Stephanie Regal, and just a terrific panel of uh, some of the state's top uh, business leaders. Uh, before we begin today's discussion, I would like to take a minute to thank our generous sponsors for making this event possible today, LCMC Health and Entergy, and we'll be right back. This is what we work for. The moments you live for. The joy. The heart. The wonder. At Entergy, we're dedicated to powering each moment. Today and for future generations. So we're leading the way with a cleaner, more reliable power grid to power every day. Because these moments matter. We power life. Entergy. Today's the day to take a walk. Or make a masterpiece with chalk. Throw a line. Join a crew. Learn to make a dark, dark room. Downward dog in Jackson Square. Whatever you're into, it's out there. At LCMC Health, we're keeping you well so you can keep getting the most out of life. All right, Stephanie, why don't you kick us off with some introductions? Thanks, Renee. Our panelists this morning include Brandon Landry, founder and chairman of Walk-On's Sports Bistro, a Baton Rouge-based restaurant chain that celebrates its 20th anniversary this year and has more than 75 locations in 13 states with 150 more restaurants in the pipeline. You may have heard the origin story. Brandon was a walk-on to the LSU basketball team who, after one too many blah chain food meals on a trip to an away game, sketched out a plan on a cocktail napkin with his teammate for a family-friendly sports restaurant that incorporated a taste of Louisiana. In other words, it would have good food, too. It took a while for the young pair to find backers who believed in them, but then persistence is the mark of a walk-on, right? In 2003, they opened their first restaurant, and over the decades that followed, Brandon grew the concept, bringing in new business partners, including NFL quarterback Drew Brees. In 2019, he launched a new fast food concept called Small Sliders, and last year he opened an upscale restaurant in Baton Rouge, the Supper Club. He recently stepped down as president and CEO of Walk-Ons, but continues to serve as board chair. And Brandon, thanks so much for carving time out of your schedule to be with us today. It's a real treat. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate you guys having me. Also with us is Pete November, CEO of Oxner Health, the state's largest not-for-profit health system and employer with a growing footprint that encompasses much of Louisiana as well as Mississippi and Alabama. Pete joined the health system more than a decade ago when his predecessor, Warner Thomas, recruited him away from the LHC group in Lafayette, where Pete had been on the other side of negotiating deals with Oxner. At Oxner, where he would eventually be tapped to serve as chief financial officer, Pete helped negotiate a string of deals that grew the health system from eight hospitals and 38 clinics a decade ago to 48 hospitals and over 300 clinics today. Pete is an attorney as well as a healthcare executive. Before Oxner and LHC, he spent more than a decade at one of the largest law firms in Atlanta, where his practice centered on healthcare deals. So he brings a wealth of experience to his new position, which he just assumed fittingly last November. Pete, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Stephanie. Happy to be here. And also with us is Brandy Christian, president and CEO of the Port of New Orleans and CEO of the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad, where she leads the nation's 10th largest port by general cargo tonnage, 17th largest container port, and oversees movement of more than 50 million tons of cargo each year throughout the New Orleans Gateway via river and rail. 
Portnola's business lines also include a real estate portfolio of more than 2,500 acres of maritime and industrial property and crews, serving as the nation's sixth largest ocean-going cruise port. In her position, Brandy directs infrastructure investments totaling nearly $2 billion and is currently overseeing the port's very exciting newest investment, the Louisiana International Terminal, that will be developed in St. Bernard Parish and dramatically increase the port's capacity. She is currently, excuse me here. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, she's currently in Washington, D.C. for Washington Mighty Girl, Pete and Philip May. Um, and she is the only female port director in the country, which is no small thing. She came to Port Nola from the Port of San Diego after a national search in 2015 when she was recruited to serve as chief operating officer. And then she was named chief executive officer in 2017. So, Brandy, thank you. Thank and you, Stephanie. Last, it's a pleasure to be here. Last but not least is Philip May, president and CEO of Entergy Louisiana, the state's largest utility and the only Fortune 500 company that provides electric service to more than 1 million customers in 58 parishes and natural gas service to more than 94,000 customers in the capital region. Philip has served as president and CEO of Entergy since 2015 and has been with Entergy since 2000. He led the successful effort to combine the Entergy Louisiana and Entergy Gulf States Louisiana operating companies to form a single stronger utility to serve Louisiana customers. Additionally, he oversaw the completion and startup of operations at Nine Mile Unit 6, which was the first new power plant added to the Louisiana fleet in nearly 30 years. He's responsible for customer service, regulatory and public affairs, resource planning, economic development programs, and charitable contributions. He has an MBA from the University of New Orleans and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Southwestern Louisiana. And Philip, thank you so much for taking time out of your business schedule to be with us today. Thank you. Great to be with you. And so to kick us off, I'm going to let Renee ask the first question and we'll have an open discussion and cover lots of interesting topics. Thank you, Stephanie. You know, one place I'd like to start is uh, to sort of ask everybody to imagine for a second to be uh, one of our viewers, right? And, and if you care about economic news, I, I feel like every day headlines are coming at you that might offer mixed signals. Will there be a recession? What about potential job loss? But there's opportunity here. I think it can be kind of dizzying uh, to the average citizen or someone uh, who cares about the economy. And so, Maybe I'll start with Brandon. Uh, Brandon, with a, with a business like yours, uh, what's your sense as the year begins? Are you looking ahead with a strong feeling of optimism, or do you have a couple of key concerns? How would how would you characterize uh, what you see on the near horizon? Yeah, look, I think there's always concern, especially coming off of what we had last year, right? But you know, I'm an optimistic person, and I don't. Let, as far as leading this company, I've always led with optimism because if you don't, and if you don't communicate that, then people just void, fill those voids with pessimism, right? Right. And it's self fulfilling, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think we learned a lot during COVID and just the, the, the communication that was coming out. Nobody knew what the heck was going on, right? But all I knew what to do here was keep the train going in the right direction. And after last year, and we've seen some, of course, supply chain and building costs and all these things. Uh, but the, the way we look at it, the way we ended 22 and going into 23 is that's behind us. And, and let's look at 23 and, and, the, and the great things that we have, the opportunities that we have. And, it, and you hear the, the recession or the depression words. And, you know, in our business, uh, the way we look at it, no matter what happens, people are going to eat. You got to eat to live. Right. And, and so we have to be that restaurant and that business of choice. And so whatever may happen in the state or the country or the world, we just got to keep doing what we've always done and stick to our purpose of bringing people together. Once again, learning what we did during COVID when they said, hey, by the way, uh, full service restaurants, you have to shut your doors. Uh, that's not something that you go to school for. Or you had a mentor that said, hey, this happened back in the 70s. Do this when they shut you down for a global pandemic. Uh, no, you got to stay optimistic and you just got to keep 
you got to keep tracking. And so that's the way we're looking at 23. And our team's ready for it. Pete, do you want to follow up on that and tell us as you sort of look forward into 2023, what are the big things on your radar that are shaping your decisions that are concerning you or giving you optimism? Yeah. Um, you know, I guess first, like Brandon, look, I'm, I'm optimistic and I think organizationally we're optimistic about the future. Um, certainly there are challenges in healthcare. care. Um, we have workforce challenges, just like, you know, I'm sure everybody else um, on this this video has uh, workforce challenges. Um, but, you know, I think just like every other challenge we face, like COVID, uh, we will uh, we will overcome it and, and be successful going forward. And um, I think, you know, we've got a really resilient team and group at Oshner. And uh, so we, we are looking forward and excited about about the future. Um, and I think, you know, for Louisiana, um, I have a lot of optimism. Um, I, I sense that there are a lot of business leaders that uh, around the state that are really coming together. And, you know, we have uh, a state where people care a lot about the state and, and the region. And so I'm optimistic about our ability to uh, to grow our economy going forward and do some great things. Is there a sense with the, you know, Brandy, on the on the point of workforce challenges, uh, how much headwinds do you see this year compared to what so many employers have had to face over the last, it's almost feels sometimes like this revolution in work. Uh, and and uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that from the angle you see it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it, it is an interesting time when it comes to labor. Um, obviously, the nature of the workplace changed with COVID in the transportation industry. Um, that can be very challenging because probably 70, 80% of our positions, they can't work from home. Um, they work on trains, they work on barges, on vessels, um, but people are looking for that balance in, in lifestyle. Um, so I think each of us as employers have had to adjust to identify the ways that we can bring the work-life balance and some of those benefits uh, into those positions that really are working out so on the field or um, you know, on a train or on the river. Um, I think that's uh, gonna be something that continues to be an issue. Um, I think we have to recruit, particularly in our industry, um, from a younger base um, coming out of high school. You know, not everybody wants to go to college. They want technical trades. I think we're learning more and more. How do we build up that workforce and prepare them for the jobs that we have, um, along with the professional technical jobs that we have as well? And, and Philip, just to sort of pick up on that a little bit in terms of, of workforce, and what do you see as you travel around the state, as you talk to your large commercial customers, are, are they back? Have they rebounded? Are there people back in the offices and back in the facilities? How would you assess where we are right now? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, there are going to be some challenges ahead, but more so, I think there's enormous opportunity for the state of Louisiana, you know, with regard to customers in general, I think it's a different style of work going forward. It's a new normal where we're seeing the kind of a hybrid and like a brand that we have our workforce, much of it, 80% has to be on site, whether it's at a power plant or in the bucket trucks to fix the lines and so forth. What we see going forward though, is an enormous opportunity and unprecedented amount of investment coming to Louisiana. That is being driven by a number of factors. It's being driven by superior infrastructure in terms of gas pipelines, deep water ports, the ability to provide feedstock and offtake capability for these industrial customers is really world class. On top of that, we have low energy prices, particularly as compared to our competitors around the world, because in Louisiana, not only do we compete with other states, we compete against the world. And what we're seeing is investment coming to Louisiana. And that investment is going to be across the board, chemical products, refining, and LNG export, like natural gas exports, that is. Also looking at ammonia and hydrogen. These are prerequisites for these investments is increasingly zero carbon energy. For Louisiana, that's gonna be in the form near term of solar. So we're making 
massive investments in solar to provide that renewable energy so we can attract businesses to the state of Louisiana. So what that means for workforce is we have to prepare our workforce for the jobs that are coming with this investment. And this investment will continue for this decade and beyond. But to prepare and have our customers, our neighbors, our communities benefit from that, our workforce has to be prepared. So that starts with early childhood education, ensures we have quality primary and secondary education, and goes on to our community colleges and, and universities and so forth, so we can prepare that. And the investments that are coming to Louisiana will benefit across the board, whether you are a pipe fitter or an engineer, accountant, lawyer, that is a huge opportunity for the state. Our chairman likes to say that we have the winning lottery ticket. All we have to do is cash it in. There will be challenges to cashing in that lottery ticket. For instance, making sure that we can site new facilities, permitting and so forth could be a challenge, whether it's solar or new uh, LNG export facility. We also could have challenges, for instance, carbon sequestration is going to be an important part of how we decarbonize industry in the state of Louisiana. But we're well positioned with geologic structures that allow that to happen, tools and technical expertise in the state as well. So I'm extremely optimistic about our future. You know, one, one question I have, and, and uh, maybe it's timely because uh, some of you all are coming from Washington. When you think about Louisiana's economic outlook, uh, as the year begins, uh, what do you think business leaders need most from uh, elected officials and the federal government in Washington to sort of maintain and stoke that sense of optimism? Uh, Pete, you, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one, not to, to keep going back to workforce, but, you know, any investment we can make in our workforce and our education in the state, um, we, you know, is really, really helpful for us. Um, and then, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, from just from a healthcare perspective, um, you know, making sure that they continue to create an environment where we can innovate in, uh, in technology and, um, and innovate in terms of how we deliver care and, uh, cont you know, continue to, uh, to do that. And they have, you know, they've invested, you know, they've uh, extended rules around telemedicine and, and other things like that, which allow us to change uh, where we go in healthcare. And then, you know, I, you know, I think everything that we can do just to, to keep our economy strong, just whatever it takes in terms of whether it's investment in our infrastructure or um, tax policy or whatever it takes to allow us to uh, to keep growing, to, to keep growing the economy in Louisiana. And I think we have I think we have everything here. And um, again, I think we've got a lot of uh, momentum and, um, you know, if, with their help in D.C. and with a lot of the folks on this phone, I think there's a lot of great opportunity ahead. So I'm hearing a lot of optimism, and that's that's really great and encouraging. I want to drill down a little bit more specifically to sort of ferret out what what has given y'all this sense of optimism and how y'all are dealing with the challenges. So Brandon, excuse me, since we've spoken about workforce shortages and everybody acknowledges that's a biggie, how how has walk-ons and your other restaurant businesses, because I know y'all have really been hard hit with this, where are the people? Have y'all been able to really identify the root of the problem? Because you hear people saying everywhere, where did they all go? I mean, we understood what happened three years ago, right? When this all started, but why haven't they come back? And how are y'all coping at a really sort of specific level? Educate us. Yeah, I think it's uh, that's a million dollar question, right? What were people doing to, to make a living? <laughs> uh, you know, for us, it, it, once again, it, it goes back to employer of choice. And, and we just had to make sure that, that the culture, because at, at some point they have to go back to work. And, and you think about the great companies out there, Raising Cats built here in Louisiana, Chick-fil-A's. There was very seldom that you saw now hiring signs on, on, their, on their buildings, right? Uh, where, where some of the other competitors, where they weren't focused on the culture and teammate development, uh, it, it, it was it, it took a turn for the worse for those companies. And so for us, it, it was just once again, sticking to our roots, you know, from a store level, I, I would say now for on our corporate side. I mean, it, it, it's no it's no secret, um, you know, right. The Advocate in the Times wrote an article about it. that We had to open up a satellite office in Atlanta and, 
you, you know, speaking about our state, I'm going to be completely transparent here. We, we have some holes. We have some gaps that we need to fill to be able to attract people, especially in our industry. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that all the other industries out there, when you, when going back to your previous question, Renee, what, what does our state have to do? People have to feel safe and, and, and people have to feel like they can get their kids a great education. And, and those were the two big things that we were missing when we were to attract great people as far as on the front end. People wanted to come work for our brand. They loved everything about walk-ons. They would come to Baton Rouge. They would come to New Orleans. They'd look at the school system. They'd look at the crime rates and be like, we're out. That's tough to compete with when you're looking out of Dallas and, and uh, the northern suburbs of Atlanta. And, and so we had to go where their talent was. And and I look, our, our company is always going to be based here. We're Louisiana. Brand. This is our home right here, looking on Tiger Stadium right outside the door. But when you're talking about attracting talent, uh, it was tough for us. And so we, we have some opportunities and, you know, speaking about going to Washington, like those are the conversations that, that, that our, our leaders need to hear. And, and we have to be focused on this if we want to keep the state the way it used to be. Right. And, and uh, there's a governor's race this year, right. And it's revving up now. And, and, uh, you know, one of the curiosities I have as it gets going, uh, over, you know, because it's a race that unfolds over months is like, uh, what do you all most want to hear in that regard for the, from the various candidates, you know, on the points, Brandon, you're making or on others, uh, Brandy, any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would absolutely echo uh, Brandon's points there. And I think when we look at this race or any of our leadership at the federal or state level, um, the support and the funding for workforce development, but also to tackle some of those really tough issues that we have, like crime, because you know, Brandon's exactly right. Um, it, it does have an impact in terms of our ability to not only attract, but to retain some of our top talent. Um, I think the, for us, the other big piece is leadership and prioritization around infrastructure. Um, obviously, state funds are limited for infrastructure. I think we'd all agree that the needs needs are great across the state. Um, and as Philip mentioned, you know, some of these projects, they go through a tremendous amount of permitting community issues, um, et cetera, that that really takes leadership and prioritization. By, by the governor and by the state delegation of where we're going to put our emphasis and um, invest in infrastructure. Pete, what would you say to that? What, yeah. In terms of healthcare, you, you alluded a few minutes ago to, you know, pro-business policies, tax policies, right. anything, but, and some of that maybe flies in the face of, of investing in education or maybe not. I don't know. How do you, yeah. what do y'all yeah, want to see? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one thing that we have to recognize, you look at states around us, um, there's some states around us that have grown economically have grown faster than we have. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think it would be great to see from all of the candidates a real plan about trying to boost the economic growth of Louisiana, like some of the states around us. Um, but I, I think part of that plan has to be workforce development and education. And I agree with Brandon Security. It, I mean, it, that that has to be part of it. Um, it's it's an issue for us in terms of recruitment and retention and something that we have to deal with. Um, so, you know, but I, I think it would be really nice to see a really well-defined plan uh, about how to try to grow our state um, with specifics around all the things that I just talked about. Um, and obviously for us, you know, we'd certainly like to uh, to, to see where their, their heads are in terms of Healthcare and funding healthcare and making sure that we're going to keep access to healthcare um, strong going forward. Philip, what about from the utilities perspective? Yeah, you know, from our perspective, first let me be clear: pro education is pro business. We have to have a workforce that meets our needs, and that comes from having quality education at every level. And I think it starts, as I mentioned, with early childhood education. So our children can be prepared when they get into primary and secondary school. We have an outstanding uh, community and technical school system that meets the needs of business. I think we can continue to expand that. One example is, uh, you know, allowing our people who are already working to reskill and get certifications and so forth. That's going coming forward through uh, the Murphy Foster Promise Program. And 
that is something that we've invested a million dollars in. And what that does is, you know, in Louisiana, you have the TOPS program. But if you don't take advantage of that right when you get out of high school, down the road, you may realize that you need additional certification, different education and so forth. This program will allow those who miss that opportunity to have access to financial aid so they go back and get certification to maybe reskill to new jobs or to add skills to advance in the jobs they currently have. So I think that's going to be very important. The last note on this topic is I think for anyone who's coming in as governor at the federal level or that type of a thing, the most important thing for businesses that are making long-term investments is certainty. Uncertainty is the thing that drives businesses away. So if we think about what Louisiana needs to do is we need to have clarity about what those policies are going to be because oftentimes these are 30, 40 or more year investment and they want to know what those policies are. They want to know that there's going to be stability around those policies. We can compete with what we have today, but change creates uncertainty and change could drive businesses to look in other areas where they see greater certainty, where those investments can continue under the rules they have for the foreseeable future. You know, just to extend that point for a second, Philip, what do you, what's your sense of, there's just so much speculation on the extent to like the likelihood of a recession later this year or not. How, how do you analyze that uh, from the lens of energy, energy and, and, and prepare for it or presume it's not going to be as bad? How, how, how would you characterize your sense of, of uh, the prospect of any recession or its depth? Yeah, so, you know, it's hard to say what the whether or not we'll have a recession across the U.S. Uh, for Louisiana, I think that, you know, the likelihood of a recession, we're not going to exactly follow what you see in the rest of the U.S. Our economy is a little different so far. We tend to lag the U.S. economy on things like that. In the meantime, though, as I mentioned, we have businesses that are coming to Louisiana investing heavily, mostly in energy intensive industries, things that produce, you know, liquefied natural gas, uh, hydrogen, carbon and so forth, all placed based on clean and renewable energy. So we have to make the investment. So for instance, we're investing heavily in making a more resilient grid. These companies want to know that even through more challenging and more severe weather, as we've seen over the past couple of hurricane seasons, that we can have a grid that can stand up to that. So we're making the investments to ensure that we can attract businesses and so forth. That investment is significant. We spend billions of dollars a year in capital. Our O&M is a is, is roughly a billion dollars in Entergy, Louisiana alone. Those investments not only include employees of Entergy, but we employ significant contractors and so forth. That in of itself is an economic driver for our communities. It helps our communities, our customers. Uh, so all of that is going to be something that drives the economy forward and will help to bolster our, our uh, health in any recessionary effects we might see in Louisiana. I want to spread the conversation around, but just since you mentioned Harden the Grid, and that was something we wanted to talk about, explain to our viewers, because there is always so much frustration around that. I know Entergy is always the whipping boy around that, and it's always in a defensive posture. Um, and yet just the other day, the Public Service Commission said that ratepayers will be picking up a little bit of the tab for some hardening right. work. How much work, and, and why can't we just like bury the cables underground or, or really make make right. things a lot more sustainable than they are. Yeah, so with regard to the grid, if you look at our our grid, the policy we've had is anything that's new, and this has been in place since about 2008. So after hurricanes, Katrina and Rita, we looked at our standards and improved those standards. And so anything new has been met meeting that new standard. So as you get close, close to the coast, for instance, you got a 150 mile per hour standard on the infrastructure that we put in place. Uh, in fact, if you have river crossings, that's 175 mile an hour standards. What the 2020 and 2021 storm season showed to us, and it also was um, also confirmed with what we saw in Florida in 2022, is we need to accelerate our investment in resilient infrastructure. When Laura struck and Lake Charles, a relatively new transmission line that we put in there, Lake Charles transmission project, 
stood up with no damage associated with that storm, just a loss of a shield wire. So we were able to use that to restart Lake Charles. Similarly, as you drive down to Grand Island and so forth, you see these massive transmission structures, thousands of, of structures along that way. Uh, of that, in the extreme southeast portion of the state, about three towers were damaged as a result of Hurricane Ida. And those three damages, the damage from those towers was from debris, one of which was a loose barge which struck the tower. So we know how to build resilient infrastructure, resilient infrastructure that can withstand that. What's different is instead of waiting for something new to be built or to repair after damage, we're going to have to accelerate that. We have filed a plan with the Public Service Commission that will allow us to invest in our grid to be more resilient. I think that's going to be critically important to do. That plan will be under consideration of the Louisiana Public Service Commission, and it's a 10-year plan that requires investment over that 10-year period and beyond. What I'll note is in Florida, they began, they had a significant storms in 2004 and 2005. They began investments after those storm seasons and have been doing it for more than a decade. So when they had Hurricane Ian in 2022, they were able to restore power within about four days. And the cost of repairing that system was less as a result of the investments they made. And then one last point I want to make here is the cost that we have that show up on customers' bills following a hurricane is not for the investment to come. It's for the repair of the damage that we had. So additional cost and additional funding and investment will be needed to build a more resilient grid that I think is necessary to have a thriving economy. You know, one of the things that I, I just said, sort of alter the t topic a bit, uh, you know, in a, job like, in a job like mine, you hear a lot from readers. And some days I think my inbox of email is almost like an informal poll of what's most on their mind. And, you know, roughly put, I, I still sort of see a lot of concern about inflation. Uh, maybe it's not as intense as it was a year ago. Uh, you know, Brandon, tell me what you think. It, 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 you know, there's so many, you're a business that serves families. Uh, there are thousands of businesses to varying degrees that serve families every day. How are you thinking about inflation now as compared to a year ago in terms of its headwinds or how disruptive it could be? Yeah, look, we're in the casual dining space, right? And so when and, and then small sliders, it's it's quick serve, right? And, and so when you're talking about our customer base, our guests, um, you know, that affects them tremendously. And, and look, we're we're high volume restaurants with low margins, right? And and so when you when you're talking about top, hitting the top line of our sales um, with less guest counts and then with prices that, that have been creeping up, you know, the bridge stays here, but if inflation happens, the bridge lowers and then what happens to the water, right? And, and so it's a lot that goes into it. And, and we've been diagnosing and really trying to, to look at the future and, and uh, looking at different things. And, and, and main thing for us right now is investing in technology, um, you know, because look, it, it, we're doing a Zoom right now, right? I mean, back, I'm sure 10 years ago, you had the old Bob Bar Barker mic and you had a panel in live and, and things are changing daily. And, and so for us, it's, it's, a, it's a complete rebuild and looking at our technology suite from our point of sale systems to just ease of access, our, our, even our website, our SEO system, everything that we can do. Going back to COVID, uh, you know, a lot of things that we did for safety uh, guests expect for convenience now. And, and so in our in our world, we just have to keep investing in this because it was so easy to just pull up and and not get out of your car and everything was done for safety. Right. And now people expect it. And, and, and so all these little things that going back to the inflation work, you know, how do we in, keep increasing guest count and in and, and sales? as you may see some dining room traffic possibly go down if some of these things happen. So we have to look at a new a new guest, a new customer that we can get to, to maybe make up for some lost sales. And now hopefully we don't get to that. I, I go back to the statement I made earlier. Um, you know, even if you look at the, the depression back in the in the days, the, the two things that people did is went to movies and they went out to eat. 
Right. Um, you, you know, so we, we feel like we're in a good spot. No matter, they might not go on their, their Disney vacation on their cruise line, but hopefully they're going to treat themselves to a meal. And once again, we have to be that restaurant and that company of choice. And, and sticking with the technology theme and, and how that intersects with inflation and costs, Pete, in healthcare, technology is sort of, you know, the driver today. And I know Oxner has really been out in front on investing in technology and sort of doing things here in Louisiana, starting back, you know, a decade ago that nobody else was doing. Um, give us a little bit of a sense of, of where y'all are with that and how how that keeps costs down and, and how you sort of balance the tension with, with people who maybe still, you know, grew up with a a doctor, you know, around the corner that they'd known forever, a family doctor. Now it is a lot more, you know, impersonal or you're doing telemedicine visits. Is is it a good thing? Is it a bad? It's it's the way it is. But um, and I guess it's the way we're going. But Yeah. Yeah. Just just first, just to tie it in, um, you know, look uh, to the inflation side. It's, you know, where it matters. There is, you know, workforce is a challenge. Labor costs are up. Um, as we said earlier, you know, um, we're not sure where all the people went. And um, so, you know, we have to use we have to think about using technology to redefine, you know, how we deliver care and um, and how we work. And uh, the other dynamic that's going on in healthcare is there's a big shift from, you know, you're seeing a big shift from commercial into Medicare because of an aging population. And, you know, so I think the way we look at it is we think, you know, using technology to redefine how we work and deliver care does help on the on these workforce challenges and on the, on the costs we see there. And then ultimately, I think, you know, healthcare organizations around the country are moving more and more to taking risk and managing the overall care for um, for our patients. When you do that, you use technology to keep people healthy and at home. And, and actually out of our facilities, which sounds counterintuitive, but um, when you do, when you take risk and you look at the whole person and um, tech, we find technology to be a great way to keep people's blood pressure under control, keep their diabetes under control, to monitor them when they're not in our facilities so that we can keep them healthy at home, which then, you know, ultimately drives down the cost of care and, and helps impact those, uh, those workforce and inflation challenges. So, I, you know, I think we uh, we're headed in that direction and, you know, we're not alone. I just came from a, a meeting with a bunch of different health systems from around the country. And, you know, it, we're all talking about the same things about the importance of using technology to uh, to deal with today's challenges. And we have generations of people coming up who, you know, you can sit on your couch and order whatever you want. And um, so, you know, people expect the same, you know, my daughter, you know, is like, dad, why do I have to go see a doctor? Can I just do telemedicine? And, you know, I think we have to get great at that because that's that's otherwise we're all going to lose generations of of people who have different expectations. You know, uh, on the point of, of where where the people went, uh, it seems like there's some aspect of that that's not a mystery. We've been writing about population loss in Louisiana. And, you know, Brandy, if you talk a little bit about that, like how significant is population loss? to the state economy and and what in your view does the state have to do to try to stem that uh you know it seems to me that if you're if you're if you're tagged as a state that's losing population that presents some issues uh for everyone from you know potential new employers to people who want to come to the state and you can sort of share some perspective on that issue as it relates to the economy because it seems significant Absolutely. And I think um, some of the points that we talked on earlier is how do we uh, retain and attract uh, individuals to work within Louisiana? Because we have the projects and the investment going into infrastructure uh, to drive some of that demand for jobs. Um, but as, as we talked about earlier, you've got to have an environment where um, people would choose to come to Louisiana, say over Texas or um, Alabama, other states that are investing heavy in infrastructure as well. Um, I think the other piece of it, particularly for us in the transportation world is, you know, Louisiana is a, a small population compared to some of our competitors like Texas. So if you look at um, Houston port, about 85% of what comes into Houston's port is consumed locally. That Louisiana will never be the size of Texas. So we really have to reach into other markets 
Um, if you look at where the population growth is happening in the Southeast and the Midwest, um, we really have the opportunity to be more of a logistics gateway. And we saw that through COVID and supply chain that um, retailers, uh, manufacturers, they're looking for states and ports that can provide that logistic connection into not just the local market, but into those broader markets. Um, when you looked at all of the ships that were sitting out in Los Angeles, the bulk of that volume was actually being railed into Chicago and into the Midwest. So you almost artificially increase your population, so to speak, because there's really no reason that we can't be the next Savannah, the next Mobile, when it comes to really being a logistics hub for the, the middle of the country. Speaking of people and Brandon, to touch on something that, that you raised a few minutes ago, and you brought it up with respect to crime and safety um, and people you know, needing to open an Atlanta office so that you could attract the talent. But specifically like to your industry, the foods delivery sector, you know, <laughs> conventional wisdom says you have to be in a Dallas or Atlanta or Orlando to really have a successful food company or a restaurant franchise business because... That's where the talent is, the technology, the other businesses that you need to really grow. What pieces are we missing here in Louisiana? That I mean, it's it's great that you and Todd Graves of Raising Kings, you know, keep the corporate headquarters in Louisiana, but the operations centers are somewhere else. So, so what do we need to do to make sure that all the pieces are here? Because our culture and our food businesses are really one of our greatest exports. Yeah, look, there's no other state like us when it comes to our food and our culture, honestly. And that that's how we've grown our brand. When when you talk about I me, mean, we're in 15 states now. And and when we go and we introduce ourselves in a new state and they would never heard of us before. And we say, yeah, we're a Louisiana sports restaurant. People go, OK, I get it. And, and nothing against any other states. But what other state can you do that with? I mean, what, what if I go somewhere and said I'm a really cool Kansas sports grill? They're going to be like, what the hell does that mean? Right. Nothing against Kansas. But when you say Louisiana, you think great food, you think great culture. So we got that piece of it. But I think it's it's what a couple other people alluded to earlier. It's we don't have the people. We're, we're not we're not we don't we don't have the talent. And if we do, they're leaving. They're leaving right away. And and that was our biggest challenge when, when you're looking at that, that trying to grow this brand and get on a national and an, and an international level at one point like todd is you, you have to have that, that that pool of people that that want to stay in this state and 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 help it grow and and like i mentioned earlier i can only speak for walk-ons right but it, we just it was difficult for us and and we tried for 24 36 months of attracting people um and and once again it was it was the brand they loved the brand but it, it was more of the area and and what they saw the opportunities and once again the crime and and, and schools were, were our biggest thing and and so I, I just i don't i don't mean to beat the dead horse but it's it's right there for us and 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 everyone knows it and and so what are we going to do about it because that's the only way we're going to get people to leave Houston and, and leave Atlanta and leave Dallas and, and to move to New Orleans and Baton Rouge to come join companies like ours and everyone else here on this panel. It, it, we have to create something other than what our companies have to offer. It, it, mm -hmm. uh, most of it is where they're going to live, how they feel when they live there. And the most important piece is how their tr children are, are going to be protected. Right. Uh, I know, uh, look, uh, my company's the, the second most important thing to me other than my family. But when you're looking at like where I'm putting my kids to school and are they safe? We have to have back to Mr. Mays in mean, certainty that that we're going to be safe. And, 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 and if it's until we get to that point, we're, we're going to have to go to other cities to, right. to be able to grow our company. Right. It continues mm -hmm. just to be fragile is what you're saying that like. Uh... To, to switch just a little bit um, to something that is, because it, we could talk about this all day and it is so important and there are so many, many threads that play into it. But Brandy, I don't want to, before we run out of time, I don't want to overlook the Louisiana International Terminal because this is a huge thing, a huge investment in St. Bernard Parish that really 
is going to help grow our very important trade and maritime industry. Um, tell the audience who may not be familiar with it exactly where it is, the timeline with it, and will it really catch us up to where we need to be? Is it, is it, is it enough to get us to where we need to be to compete with Houston, Long Beach, and these other massive deep water ports? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the uh, terminals, Louisiana International Terminal in St. Bernard Parish, uh, it is a, a greenfield project. Um, we purchased about 1,200 acres of property. The terminal itself would be under 400. Um, you know, we were, I was having this discussion last night that there has not been a greenfield container terminal built in this country um, in almost 15 years. And you likely won't see a lot of uh, ports being built capacity because of space, permitting, you name it. Um, so it's a huge opportunity for the state because it brings a piece of infrastructure, as I, I usually describe to people not in the industry. It's just like having an international airport is you're not going to be able to talk to a Fortune 500 company. You're not going to land the big events if you don't have that infrastructure. And if you look at what happened through supply chain congestion and COVID, that is not going to slow down. Uh, people have moved to e-commerce. Um, that is what's driving a lot of this port development is driving the container business. Um, we're under the permitting process now that typically takes about two to three years, uh, hopeful to have permits by 2025 and then begin construction to open in 28. Um, I think for that to be successful, um, the area we've been very, very focused on is attracting more imports into the state. We've been phenomenal at as an export um, container port, almost 65% of our business because of the petrochemical industry, the Louisiana farms. Um, but just like an airplane, you have to be able to fill that ship, go, you know, coming into the market and leaving the market. Um, but that's a huge opportunity, not just for New Orleans, but for the entire state, because imports are driven by retailers, distribution centers, and because of the congestion on the West Coast, they're looking for other gateways, just like New Orleans that um, can bring in distribution. And we're seeing great momentum since the announcement, um, major retailers, Medline is about to cut the ribbon on their new distribution center on North Shore. Uh, Como Tires just announced in Franklin, Louisiana, Amazon and Baton Rouge. Um, so we're seeing that real momentum now that we're making the investment in the infrastructure um, for these retailers and manufacturers, they have to know that we're gonna be able to service the larger vessels. And frankly, we've not been able to do that or have a plan for that um, up until this time. You know, maybe uh, Philip, in the time we have left, we have uh, a couple more questions we could ask. It, you know, I think a lot of our viewers, uh, you know, they get so many conflicting signals about uh, the economy and its strengths or, or what's what's it vulnerable to. Uh, maybe you could take a minute and, and, and tell them, like, what do you look at the most for the strongest indicators of right track, wrong track, economic trend, trends? What, how, how would you help them sort of yeah. think about the year ahead, what to look at most as a family or as a small yeah. business person? You know, the thing that I look at on a continuous basis is who is coming to Louisiana to look and see if they want to site their business here. The that pipeline of industries and commercial businesses that are looking at Louisiana today are the longest I is longest, deepest and most robust that I've seen in my 37 year career. We have an opportunity ahead of us in terms of industrial and commercial growth that is likely to only be matched by what we saw in the 60s and 70s in Louisiana. It is that big. And as I said, this is the winning lottery ticket. We have to cash it in. And there are a lot of challenges to making that happen. You talked about the quality of life issues. We have to be able to attract talent. We have to fix the quality of life issues. And all of that starts with education, as we said multiple times here. We have to invest in education to fix the quality of life issues, to attract the resources and the human capital that we need. And that will allow us to cash in that lottery ticket. And along the way, I think it's the stability of the rules and regulations and so forth. There are things that we need to tweak, but if you make math significant changes to that 
That is uncertainty and businesses do not like to invest in the face of uncertainty. I see literally more than $100 billion of investment coming to Louisiana with tens of thousands of jobs available to, to our children, to our communities and so forth. In order to have those jobs go to those people, we have to have an education system that prepares them, not only through that traditional period in which, you know, from grade school to whether they graduate from high school or a technical school or university, we have to have the ideal this is a continuous education process because technology is changing the way we do business. Technology is adding new opportunity. We have to prepare our workforce for those changes by continuing to get them certifications, additional education and skills that allow them to be relevant and to continue to do well in their career. I think we can do that. I think we have the right ingredients in place. As noted by the other participants here, I think quality of life is something we have to tackle and it all starts with education. I don't want to assume, oh, I'm sorry, go well, ahead. I was, to, I was just gonna ask the same question to, to, to Pete real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, what would be your tip to the to the viewer or the family in terms of like the signs of right track, wrong track of economic prosperity? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I tell them is don't get up every day and look at the stock market. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would uh, actually, it's not like Philip, the way, I mean, our, our organization and, and, um, and I think the health of the state is largely dependent upon our ability to continue to grow jobs at a, at a faster pace. And our organization is successful if, if there's more job growth in the state. And um, so when I, earlier we're talking about optimism, I, when you see that, that's really important to us. And I, and I think should be really important to people in Louisiana. Um, and then just, you know, to keep going though, we've, we've got to deal with education and uh, we've got to deal with safety um, because we can grow where it, we may be able to bring companies in, but we're not gonna be able to keep them and attract talent if we can't deal with those issues. And so, um, but I do, I think that's the, that's the thing that I would look at the most is what is our outlook in terms of job growth in the state, which I think right now is is, pos is on a positive trajectory. But I think this election coming up, the governor's election, you know, again, that's what I want to hear from them is how are we going to keep that going and what are we going to do to make that happen? Because we can't lose that momentum and, and actually need to accelerate that going forward. We sort of with a big picture perspective, I had just wanted to ask, since this is a statewide economic outlook, even though we're all pretty much focused on South Louisiana and we've alluded to things going on in the Southwest, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, a lot of that. But what do y'all see going on in North Louisiana um, that's significant, that's encouraging? Or I mean, there's tremendous poverty and under investment up there. And a lot of people down here probably don't even realize it. But y'all are up there, Pete. I know Entergy, you're around. Brandon, you have restaurants everywhere. Any significant things in North Louisiana that, that we should be aware of? I could start. Uh, yeah. You know, I think if you look at what's going on in, in North Louisiana, a couple of things, things that are going well right now, you have uh, the timber industry is doing well. The price of timber is up and that's helping for that. In addition, you're seeing uh, particularly in the northwest part of the state, natural gas prices are driving investment in natural gas drilling and that type of thing in the shale areas of the state. So that is driving additional investment, additional income to the area and so forth. Uh, if you look at what we have opportunities with regard to long term, I think that along the I-20 corridor is a natural place for manufacturing of some kind. And I think generally and ideally, uh, associated with the automobile industry. Uh, you have a lot of automobile manufacturing plants in that region along the I-20 corridor as you head east and so forth. And I think we're well situated to do that. One of the things that Entergy has done is invested in uh, providing manufacturing skills through our technical colleges in North Louisiana, because when on a manufacturing company looks at that area and it will be an attractive area to invest in, you have to have a workforce that's ready to go to work and we have to supplement that so we can attract businesses. A major manufacturing company facility in the Northeast part of the state will forever change the economic outcomes of that area. It's something we need to do. Anybody yeah, else? Yeah, Steph, go ahead, Brandon. No, you go, go ahead, go ahead, Pete. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, like, we, we've we've seen the natural gas investment up there um, and, so, and we've seen momentum. Um, and so we've made a lot of investments up there from a healthcare perspective. I think, you know, the medical school up there, you know, building a new school started to to bring in some additional growth and jobs in um, in uh, the Shreveport area. And I, I would say that uh, that part of the state, you've got a, a very active um, and very focused group of legislators, and uh, which is a good thing. I mean, they are very, very focused on growing it and making sure there's investment. And um, I think that that's, you know, part of, I think, what will will help going forward. Um, so, you know, I think in the last really couple of years, we've we've started to see some momentum in, in North Louisiana. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll just say really quick. I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, we have a handful of restaurants and both concepts up there and, and, and they do really well. But once again, Shreveport has opportunities. Right. And, and when you're looking at we were the title sponsor to the Independence Bowl for three years up there. And, um, you know, that the city has something special with a, a bowl game like that. And they, they had opportunities to get behind it and really attract people from around the country. Um, and, and it was it, it was really hard pushing this this barrel uphill, you know. And so I, I think, you know, when you're looking at leaders up in the in the northern part of the state, especially in Shreveport, which is crime infested as well, uh, they have opportunities up there. And if I could just add something that Pete said, if you look at the universities and some of the things they're doing in that part of the state, whether from Shreveport over to Monroe, uh, La Tech, University of Louisiana, Monroe, the technical schools and their partnerships they're forming with industry and so forth around technology, medical technology as well. I think that is a real prospect for growth in a burgeoning business that can help that region for the long term. Great. Um, well, I think we are just about at that time. Uh, gosh, we have covered a lot of ground uh, in such a broad range of topics. Uh, really appreciate everyone's perspective. Uh, I think it's insightful and helpful uh, to our viewers. Um, and it's only January, so we'll see where this uh, goes. Uh, Stephanie, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to uh, Philip, Pete, Brandon, Brandy. Really, really appreciate your time. Uh, to the three of you all in Washington, I hope you all have a good Washington uh, Mardi Gras. Uh, brings back some beads or whatever they do there. Uh, and uh, But thanks again. Really appreciate your perspective on uh, such a big issue at such a big time, particularly in uh, a political year for Louisiana. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you.